understanding the principles of the kingdom. And I believe it might be good for me to begin talking briefly about religion and the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom is an idea. It's a concept that needs to be understood. And the Bible is a very difficult book if you don't understand the kingdom concept. The Bible is not about a religion. It's about a kingdom. I believe the greatest enemy of the kingdom is religion. It's not atheism. It's not sinners. And the reason why the, the greatest enemy of religion of the kingdom is religion is because religion parades itself as a substitute for the kingdom. That makes it dangerous. If you believe you already have something, then you stop looking. And that is the challenge of religion. So if you believe you found something, then you stop searching. And religion pretends that it provides what man's looking for. And somehow religion has convinced humanity that it has found what it's looking for. So humanity, even though it is not satisfied with religion, stops earnestly searching. Deep in their hearts, they know something's missing. They know that what they're involved in is empty. They are quite aware that the rituals are not satisfying their deepest yearning. But they've been convinced by religion that you've found what you're looking for. And the result of that is people back off and they say, well, I'll just endure this religion experience. Jesus came to earth to bring a kingdom and not a religion. God's redemptive work and his program was to restore his kingdom. Now, this statement up on the board at the moment is very important. What we've done is we have reduced God's program, which is a means to an end, to to the purpose itself. God's ultimate goal was to re-establish his kingdom on earth, which is what Adam lost. But we have magnified the program and made it more important than the result. We've actually turned the process into the end. This is why Calvary is more important than the kingdom. I'm saying some heavy things here. That's why the blood is more important than dominion. Jesus never preached about his blood. Am I too bold? I really don't care. I want you to read the four Gospels for yourself. Every statement I am making has taken me 30 years to make them. I thought about them for 30 years. That's why I can make them now. I'm not irresponsible. We have made the the process of redemption more important than the purpose for redemption. And that's why we have built a religion on the process and have, for the most part, ignored the purpose for it. This is why most of you are here today. 
you are here today because somewhere you heard the kingdom message, at least a little piece of it, and you thought, I never heard of that before. And I've been saved for 40 years. See, you've been preoccupied with the process for 40 years. The kingdom is the purpose for that process. Very important. Man, therefore, has reduced the means to the end. When your car breaks down, what becomes your problem? Mobilization. Am I right? When your car stops working, you become immobilized. So you take your car to a mechanic. The mechanic initiates a process. The purpose for repairing your car is not for you to worship the car. But to regain what the car used to provide for you. Which is what? Mobilization. So you don't worship the mechanic. You don't sing songs about wrenches and batteries. You don't spend years thanking the mechanic for what he's done. You get the car back and you drive. And so for almost 2,000 years, we've been stuck at the mechanic shop with the car in the garage of the mechanic thanking the mechanic, singing to the mechanic, and describing all of his equipment. And we've not been driving for 40 years, for 2,000 years. We appreciate the mechanic. Oh, yes, we thank him all the time. But we've not appropriated what he fixed. Very important. Write this down. Man's misconception, therefore, has produced religion. Religion is, 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 is man's attempt to satisfy his emptiness. Man is suffering from missing something. He misses dominion. And he wants it back, and he's coming up with programs to try and get it. Those programs are what we call religion. So, when we talk about the kingdom, a couple of thoughts here. The message of the Bible is about a king, a kingdom, and his royal family. That's what the Bible is about. If you read the Bible any other way, you're going to get involved in the means to the point where they become more important than the end. Every human being, 6.7 billion of them are seeking for the same thing. They're seeking for the kingdom. I'm going to show you this in a minute from the statements of Jesus. But according to, to Christ, Every human being is seeking for the kingdom. Some are not sure what they're looking for, but they know they're looking for something. And they're using everything they possibly can to try and find this thing that they don't know what they're looking for. So Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Islam, Taoism, Confucianism, Scientology, Baha'i faith, all of these different processes are a result of man's search for the kingdom. Therefore, all religions are man's attempt to find it. Jesus used some statements about this. He said, he said, the kingdom of God is under pressure. He says, and all men are forcing their way into it. All men. Everyone. 
it doesn't mean they're getting into it. It means that they're trying to find it. They're trying to get to it. And they're doing all kinds of things that puts the pressure on life. The mission of Jesus, simple mission. It was a kingdom message. He never preached anything else. That's all he preached. And it's very important to note that all true kingdoms contain the same qualities, characteristics, and components. Jesus Christ introduced the kingdom concept back to the earth. I want to stress, and in my newest book that will be coming out in a few weeks throughout the world, this book deals with some important issues to re-educate everyone who was born in the Western world about the kingdom, what a kingdom is. Because if you don't understand what a kingdom is, you, it's impossible to understand the Bible. As a matter of fact, I have come to the conclusion that the majority of the Western theologians are part of the problem that God has. Because they are literally experts in defection. The defects in the theology because they study the Bible from their culture and they bring to bear on their interpretation of the Bible their cultural experiences here you have a first-class theologian in the top seminary in America who was born in America all his life never lived under a kingdom, have no idea about kingdom concepts, kingdom culture, kingdom protocol, and now he has to present the Bible to his students. In this book on the kingdom, people wonder why I spend the first two chapters talking about one issue, concepts. Is because you can only interpret through your concepts and if your concepts are wrong then your conclusions are wrong and this is why we need to deal with the very concept what is a kingdom Christ did not use the word kingdom as a symbol he used the word kingdom because that's exactly what he bought. So you must study what a kingdom is to understand every word he makes and states. I stress, for us to understand a kingdom, we have to look at these concepts and understand how they work. Now, I want to make it clear that a kingdom is not a religion it's not a religion at all hmm. kingdoms don't have members for example no members live in, in the kingdom kingdom of citizens not members you cannot be a member of a country and a kingdom is a country see membership for example is by privilege but citizenship is by right. Amen. And if you get it mixed up, you can't function. It's concepts. Let's read uh, what I call the, the mission statement of Jesus. His first public statement, Matthew, uh, is when he began to really talk about his work. Matthew 3, verse 1. Now, some of you think that John preached about baptism. That is not true. I don't know why we call him John the Baptist. That is not what his name is. What did John preach? Read it for yourself. John preached the exact same message of Jesus. John did baptism. But he preached the kingdom. I 
I was born in this country in 1954, right here in this island. At that time, we were not a country. We were what they call a colony of a kingdom. We were under a queen and a king. I grew up most of my life under a queen and a king. In 1973, our country became what they call independent from the kingdom. We are still in the Commonwealth, but we were under a king all the way up to 1973. That's just 30 years ago or so. Okay? So we're a very young country. So most of my life was under a kingdom. And therefore, my cultural experience is closer to the Bible than most of you. Because the concepts under which I was born were kingdom concepts. Here's a concept, for example. A king never shows up. It's called royal protocol. A king will never just show up. When a king is coming anywhere or going anywhere, it is required protocol for the king to send ahead of himself what they call a herald. It's his kingdom stuff. So a king can never just show up. They have to send someone ahead to prepare the people for royal arrival. When I was a boy and the King of England was coming to the Bahamas or the Queen was coming to the Bahamas, we would get notice one year in advance as a colony. And we had to sweep the roads. Sweep the roads, I said. We had to clean our houses even though chances are she would never come in your house. You see, you weren't sure whether she might decide to come through your corner. That's how real it was. So everyone cleaned their houses, sweep their yards, planted new flowers all along the streets. Why? Because the king is coming right. a year in advance. And the person who bought that communique from England was called a herald. John the Baptist <laughs> is introduced when? in Malachi last three verses and it says before the Messiah comes he will send one before his face and he will prepare the way why it's royal protocol see some of you want God to show up in your church meeting you wonder why he wouldn't come no preparation you walking in late <laughs> sin in your life God said, I ain't going there so he sends the Holy Ghost ahead to try and get you to get your act together. You ignore the Holy Ghost. Meeting starts at 10. You come in at 10.20. Listen, if you ever miss an appointment with a royalty, it's over. Did you know that? It's over. They don't want to see you no more. It's royal protocol. So here's John the Baptist, and he comes to what? Announce the coming of the king. Let's read what he announces. John 3, 1. In those days, John the Baptist came, what? Preaching. Preaching, Preaching means to announce or declare. It wasn't a sermon. <laughs> you know, in the 16th century, 17th century, when kingdoms covered the whole earth, I mean, all over Europe were kingdoms. There was a kingdom, you know, Great Britain, France, Portugal, Spain. These were all kingdoms. And whenever a king was coming to a village, he would send a herald ahead of him. And the herald would go like two, three weeks before. He would walk through the village with this big patchment. And he'd say, hear ye, hear ye, his royal highness is on the way. Prepare yourselves, hear ye. That was called preaching. Declaring announcing John the Baptist is that herald and he comes to planet earth that's the village earth village earth earth village got it yeah the planet is a village and the king is coming to visit the village to fix the village back so he sends his herald ahead of him and the herald says what repent for the kingdom of heaven is there The 
word repent means to change your thinking. Think differently now. The word repent means to change the way you've been conditioned to think. The word repent means to uneducate yourself <laughs> so you can be re-educated because what's about to come does not sync with your education. Everything you've been taught is contrary to what you're about to see and hear. So change your thinking. That's the word repent. John the Baptist announces the coming of the king and his kingdom. By the way, uh, when you see the new book, get it. It's, it's going to be the most exciting experience for you. Because in that book, you know, I try to explain how kings are. There are about uh, 35 unique things about a king that you need to learn to understand Jesus. And you can't study a king by studying a president. And most of you were born under a president or a prime minister. A king is opposite to a prime minister and a president. Completely opposite. For example, one thing about a king is this. Whenever a king shows up, the whole kingdom is present. He is his government. <laughs> so when John says, change your mind, for the kingdom is coming, he was saying the entire government of heaven is about to arrive on earth because the king himself is about to come when uh, Philip asked Jesus show us the father Jesus says look all of us are here he that has seen me Now, in the next chapter, Jesus is introduced. Matthew 4, 17. Read what he says. From that time forward, Jesus began to declare, announce, to preach. Quote, repent for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Uh, there's a word in your New King James or your King James Version which says, is at hand that statement is an old English statement from the 17th century. It means has arrived. This is the unique announcement of Jesus. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Now, remember what a kingdom is? It's the government of a country. So he was not introducing a religion at all. He was bringing back to earth what Adam lost. And apparently, Adam did not lose a religion. If you want to know what man lost, study what Jesus brought to earth. Because he came to restore whatever man lost. And here he's announcing what he's bringing. He says, change your mind because a government has arrived. The ruling influence of a king has returned to earth. This is the announcement of Jesus. I put it to you then. Look at Matthew. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. I love this verse. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of what? The kingdom. And then healing every disease and sickness among the people. By the way, uh, it's important to you when you read the four Gospels again about his message and his method, you will notice that he normally preached the kingdom first and then he did miracles. In other words, he, he, he didn't do it the other way around. There's a reason. There's a reason. I'll give you the most important reason. A kingdom is the influence of a government in a territory. So if, 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 if you tell someone, a government's influence is in this city, a new government has arrived here today. Their first question, prove it. So then he has to do some action. So he takes diseases of people, 
takes demons out of people. He gives them sight and hearing and whatever was wrong with them. He corrects it to, to confirm, reinforce, and to give evidence that the new government is present. Let me tell you another example. How do you know that the British kingdom was here? Just try drive here. Do you see what I'm saying? The evidence is you drive on the left-hand side here because a kingdom was here. Why do we drink tea in the Bahamas rather than coffee? Because a kingdom was here. You see, there has to be evidence that the government is here. Are you with me? So when the Bible says, he, he says, the kingdom of heaven is here, it says, and then he proved it. Very important. So, the principal message of the Bible then is threefold. A king, a kingdom, and a royal family. Tell your neighbor, I'm in. Okay, listen. You have royal genetics. Let me tell you something about kingdoms. You don't vote kings into power. And you don't vote their children into power. Rulership is in the blood. Say it. <laughs> Listen, Prince Charles is not made prince because you like him. Rulership is passed on through genes. This is why you must be born again. You, you can't... <laughs> Hallelujah. It's about a royal family. The Bible is about a royal family. It's about a family business. The family business is rulership. That's our family business. We are in the rulership business. And our daddy rules the whole universe. And he provides a little place for his kids to practice rulership called earth and he put us there and told us go ahead kids take over let me see how you learn from papa he he gave us the genes that's why you hate to be told what to do you are wired to give commands not to take them some of y'all look so humble on me you know i'm talking the truth you know you you that's why you love to be in control of life that's why you short circuit when you owe people money because you ain't supposed to be a slave to the lender you're not built for it no oh, I don't want to start teaching at that level yet see that's why when God called Abraham and he told him he says look if I'm going to restore you to your dominion let me warn you about the effects of it number one you're gonna be rich <laughs> he said number two you will be the head not the tail number three you will be above only that's the effects of getting your dominion back he said you'll be a lender they never get your royalty back Here's a dilemma. I call it kingdom now, kingdom come. You know, a lot of people wonder, is, is the kingdom here? Is it, is it present now? Well, here's a couple of thoughts. We are citizens when? Now. Right now. Citizens right now. We are in the kingdom when? Now. Right now. We have access to kingdom power when? Now. Right now. These are important statements. The kingdom will come to earth in its fullness when the king returns. But the kingdom is here now. Let me give you an example. If you are from another country here right now, you are in the Bahamas. But you are not a citizen of the Bahamas. But you are in the Bahamas. So your country is not from here. 
You are in the Bahamas, but not of the Bahamas. Now, you are not as rich as the country you are in. You are as rich as the country you are from. That's why Jesus refused to be from earth. If you claim that earth is your home, you are poor. See, it's possible to be born on the earth, but not be from the earth. They said to him many times, aren't you the carpenter's son? Is not your mother Mary? Are not your brothers and sisters here with us today? And he would answer, I came down from my father. <laughs> he would answer, no man knows where I came from. I'm going back to where I came from. I came down from my father. He that was sent from the heaven is now on earth. He kept on, he refused to be from earth. See, as long as you ain't from earth, you are as rich from, as where you came from. So Miles Monroe is not from earth. I am on earth. But I'm not from earth. That puts my resources beyond the limitations of your economic system. Very important. Write this down. The kingdom is growing and expanding when? Right now. I am a citizen of the Bahamas no matter where I go. I am always a citizen of the Bahamas no matter where I go. So it doesn't matter where you are, you are always a citizen of your country. So whether you are on earth or not, you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. If you are in the kingdom of God. You don't need to go to heaven to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's the point I'm trying to make. So the kingdom is when? Now. I am a Bahamian now. Whether I'm in Africa or Asia or Canada or California, I am a Bahamian now. So wherever you are, you are that now. You are in that kingdom now. I am not going to be a Bahamian citizen. It's effective now. Very important. Is the kingdom here now? Here's some couple of questions you want to answer. Matthew 26, verses that you never saw before. Verse 29. I tell you the truth. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let me ask you a question. Do you read the Bible? No, you don't. Here's a verse you never read. Okay, Jesus is about to die. He has a few days left on earth, and he makes this statement. He says, look, I'm going to leave you all in a few days. He said, but I'll make you a promise. I'll drink and eat with you again. So here he is at this supper on the front side of the cross. He says, now, I will not eat with you again. Read it, read it carefully. Until what? Read the whole thing and tell what? Okay. In other words, I, I'm, I'm going to drink wine and bread with you and eat with you now. He says, now this is my last meal. You and I will not eat and drink again until I am in the kingdom, when the kingdom is enforced. So he goes to the cross. Right after that, they kill him. He rises again the third day and he meets them again. And guess what he does? He pours wine. He eats. Hallelujah. We don't think about it. It's 
See, some of you are thinking the marriage supper of the Lamb, you know, in the last day. No, no, no. He said, look, I can eat this with you again. Whenever I eat with you again, we're in the kingdom. Now, to explain that whole process, you got to understand how kingdoms work. He goes to the cross, he dies. I'm making this very fast because of time. He, he raises from the dead. Guess what he does? He goes to each one of them and he does something that we don't, we don't understand. He breathes on each one of them. And he says, receive, receive the Holy Spirit. Write the word receive down. I want to show you something to change your life. Receive. Say it. Receive. Now write it again, but this time take away the prefix. Press. Come on. Write R-E. That's the prefix. Remember, a prefix is not a word, right? It's a grammatical stem added to a word to change the meaning of it. Okay. Now, what does re mean? Re means to go back to the original state. So when you take away the word prefix, I mean the prefix uh, re, you have what? So sieve is a word. We don't use it anymore. It's an old 16th century word. The word sieve, write it down, C-I-A-V. Sieve means to have. To have. Or to possess. Now, when you put re back in front of it, it means to possess again. You can never receive something you never had before. So Jesus could not say, Seed the Holy Spirit. Because they already seed it in Genesis chapter 2. When the Bible says, God, breathe into man the breath. Then man sins and the Holy Spirit leaves. Oh, man. I just finished writing a brand new book for the Whitaker Publishing House in Pennsylvania. It's coming out in January. It's probably the most important book I have ever written on the Holy Spirit. The book is called The Most Important Person in the World. It's a long title. It's going to be on the New York uh, distribution list in January. The book is my attempt to explain who the Holy Spirit is. But let me just give you a glimpse, just one little snippet of it. In every time there's a kingdom, when there's a kingdom, all kingdoms like to extend their influence. So they like to go and get new territory. When they get new territory, they normally would colonize it. Colonize it means that they hook the territory up to the kingdom and then they send through that hookup everything that makes the territory just like the kingdom. Now the person they use to convert the territory into the kingdom is a person they call the governor. If you drive downtown in the Bahamas, don't forget your visitors, please take a tour. Tell them to take you to the governor's mansion. There's a pink wall downtown with a big house behind it. It's called the governor's house. That house was always occupied by a white British man all my life until 1973. No Bahamian can live in there. Why? Because the governor that was put there for 250 years of colonization in the Bahamas had to come directly from the Queen of England, sent by her. He lived in the Bahamas. He was a British man who didn't speak our language and his job was to make us British. And as long as he was in the colony, Britain was in the colony. Are you following me? Yes. See, the governor that you have in America, is not, that's not the original concept of governor. Governor, see, Pilate was a governor. His job was to make Palestine just like Rome. That's why it says, when in Rome, do as Romans do. Wherever Rome is, you are in Rome. The governor lived in the colony. Remember? They never lived in England. They had to live with the people. They had to stay on the property in the colony. Why? Because they had to be there to make sure the property became England. It was the governor who had all the authority. He's the one who got the speech from the throne, they call it. He got the mind of the king or queen and made it clear to the citizens. And he made us understand what the king was thinking all the time. And he made us drive on the left hand. He made us wear suits in 90 degree weather. 
Because that's what the kingdom wore. He made us drink tea. He made us drive on the left. He made us wear short pants and long socks with tie. Why? That's the way the kingdom dressed. He made us eat chocolate with tea. He made us eat cucumber sandwiches. Yuck! It was British sandwich. In other words, he made us speak English. We lost our African language. His job was to give us the, the kingdom's language. Now watch this. And you'll remember this. Don't forget this. You can remember this, Pastor. The moment you declare independence from the kingdom, the governor becomes illegal. So he has to leave and go back to the kingdom. The minute Adam declared independence in Genesis chapter 3, the governor left. Holy Spirit left. That means the, the kingdom left. When Jesus came back to earth, the Holy Spirit was nowhere else. The Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. He had the whole ghost. <laughs> so so that's why John says repent why the kingdom coming back and when he comes he says here it is why the contact with the kingdom is in the earth again the governor is in the mansion you don't understand what I'm talking about so when he came from the resurrection power and he met with them in that room and he said receive the governor oh you're gonna get it he says now we can eat again and drink again because the kingdom has arrived it's no longer just in me now but as many as would believe they become the governor's mansion your body is the temple That's why he says the kingdom is not over there and over here. He says it is within you. Wherever the governor is, the whole government is. Shatabusa. That's why I'm a dangerous man. We are about to build a big mall up there. It's going to cost millions of dollars. Because the governor told me very clearly that he wants us to occupy until the king comes. Now the governor is present, okay? So we got to occupy real estate. We got to occupy economic influence. We got to occupy political influence, education influence, scientific influence. We got to occupy influence because the governor is here to influence the territory. Oh, come on, somebody. Let me tell you something. Heaven is not supposed to look like earth. Earth is supposed to look like heaven. So he says when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who is where? In the headquarters country. Holy is your name. Thy kingdom influence come. Thy will, what you want, be done where? In the colony. How? Like it is in heaven. Give him a hand for his program. He's a program of influence. Matthew 16 real quick verse 27 and 28 he says I tell you the truth some who are standing here with me now he says will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom he said that 2,000 years ago to people sitting in a village standing next to him he says he says you, you will still be alive when the kingdom comes now listen our problem is we keep postponing it to the future
Either Jesus lied or the kingdom is here. Very important. So according to him, everybody is searching for the kingdom. He has a verse to remember this. Every religion is a result of the search for the kingdom. And no religion or ritual can substitute for the kingdom of God. So no matter what we do, we'll never be satisfied unless and until we find the kingdom. This is why religion does not satisfy people. That includes Christianity. Christianity is a religion. So the human spirit is looking for what it lost. It lost the kingdom. Here's something to remember then. Luke chapter 6. Jesus said these words in verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. The word blessed means happy. He said if you are spiritually poor and bankrupt, you can now be happy. Why? For the answer to your poverty has arrived. Blessed are those who are spiritually poor, spiritually empty, spiritually bankrupt. That includes six billion people all over the world. He says, your spiritual hunger can only be fulfilled by the kingdom. And this is why all of your years of Christianity, there's still an empty spot there. When I found the kingdom, I stopped searching. Amen. I don't want anything else. Can you imagine that? There's, I don't want nothing else in life. Nothing else in life. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm debt free because of the kingdom. That's supposed to be your story too. Hmm. You came here this week and God is going to change your thinking. See, how do I explain this? And it starts with thinking. Repent thinking if your concepts are wrong your life is wrong because as a man thinking that's the man this week every session is going to be working on your thinking to challenge your old thoughts the ones that are not fruitful you know they ain't fruitful and they ain't working you tired broke and speaking in tongues and singing at the same time you, you go to every service and can't pay your rent I mean this doesn't make sense to me your mortgage still on your shoulder after you are 60 years old and you, you never missed a choir meeting. Something's wrong with this. I mean, either, either God just loves to see you punish or something ain't working. Don't miss a session, please. This is more important than everything you're doing, what I'm telling you, this conference, because if, if you get this, yeah. <laughs> everything changes. Everything. Amen. Give a couple of thoughts before we close. Luke 12, verse 32. The kingdom means living under another government. Remember? The kingdom is a government. Luke 12, 32 says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you what? The kingdom, not a religion. Verse 33. Therefore, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief can come near, no moth destroy. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, he, he, he connects this to kingdom. He says, it's the Father's pleasure not to give you Christianity. What's a kingdom? A government. He wants you to have a government. That means the power to control circumstances. To influence the environment. 
It's the Father's good pleasure to give you back dominion over the earth. Very important. The focus of Jesus. Some scriptures real quick. Matthew 5. By the way, don't ignore these scriptures. It helps you to show that Jesus only preached this one message. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes of the law, you will certainly not enter what? The kingdom of heaven. In other words, he said the whole pursuit is to get into this kingdom. Matthew 6, 9, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, 17, from that time forward he began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 4, 43, but seek ye first, I must preach, you have to seek the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. He keeps on repeating it. Look at Luke 9, 2, it says, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom kingdom of God and to then heal the sick always to heal after you preach yeah very important this is really the heart of Jesus look at these scriptures you know uh, the, the question I want to close with today is why did God choose a kingdom and not a republic for his system of government another question why did God choose a kingdom and not a democracy instead of a democracy he chose a kingdom system Thirdly, what is the benefits of being in a kingdom over and against being in a democracy or a republic? There's a big difference. Why is a kingdom better than a democracy? According to God, a kingdom is better than democracy because he chose the kingdom instead of democracy. And God always knows best. <laughs> but the question is, why did he do that? You have to understand kingdoms to appreciate the answer. What are the advantages of being in a kingdom over and against being in a democracy and a republic? I'll tell you the difference. Heart attack, stress, high blood pressure, <laughs> stroke. Because in a democracy, you've got to fight to make a living. In a kingdom, you don't look for nothing except the kingdom and righteousness. And all these things. In a democracy, you've got to run after things. In a kingdom, you run after the kingdom and righteousness. That's it. And all these things things why do you worry what you will eat what you will drink what you will wear he says stop this it's too much stress Christianity is killing more people than you could believe because Christianity makes you compete for blessings it's stressful religion is hard work with very little benefit Jesus said come unto me and he was talking to those religious people under stress all you are heavy laden let's get some rest he says come on take my yoke upon you he said man this is too much stress for you my yoke is easy you're supposed to have an easy life I'm not talking. I am telling you what I'm living. I went to the doctor to get a check and my doctor's back here, sitting right back there. Stand up, Dr. Chris. He can be one of our speakers. Don't miss him. He's a powerful speaker. He's one of my doctors. And he gave me a full checkup the other day. And he said to me, he said, Dr. Monroe, you got the body of an athlete. I'm 52, okay? He said, I've never seen anyone's blood pressure at your age this perfect. See him there. He, they took it twice to make sure it wasn't a mistake. No stress. No prostate cancer. No nothing. Let me tell you something. What's killing us is running in the rat race and praying all our way through it. Pray for things. Why do you worry what you will eat, drink, and wear? How you will live? He said, stop it. Only pagans worry about these things.